We are making our way through what book, church? Mark. So today we're in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And I'd like to read from the New Living Translation a story that I believe for many of us in the room, as I look around and see many familiar faces, a very familiar story. But I believe as we dive into God's Word this morning that there's kind of two streams of thought in which we'll kind of dive in together as we read through this account of Jesus in the boat with his disciples. So I'd like to open up our time by reading God's word, praying, and then looking at this text in kind of two parallel streams of thought of what God is doing and what God might be speaking to our hearts this morning, both collectively and individually. Does that sound good? Can we do that this morning? Okay, let me read. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and then started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon... A fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Father, as we open your word this morning, Simply and humbly, I ask that you'd open our hearts to the truth of your word. God, that you would speak to us. And Lord, that our hearts and our hands and our heads would be attuned to your spirit. Lord, that you'd move powerfully by your spirit through your word in a way that I really trust and believe that only you can uniquely do. Lord, in these next few moments that we have together, would Would you just allow me to serve your people well? Lord, by just opening up the scriptures and showing and sharing Jesus, how you are truly the center, not only of this story, but in the center of every single storm in our lives. Lord, we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You know, it's been a... uh, if I'm going to be honest, it's been, a, it's been a full week for our family and just in the life of our church. There's so many things that happen in the month of May. I mean, parents with children or maybe teenagers in the home, maybe you've heard how I'm sure many people have described this month, the month of may Sember. Have you heard that term before? The month of May can be just as busy and it seems like as full and as dynamic as Christmas time. I mean, in our little world for this month, we've had family birthdays, an anniversary, obviously Mother's Day, school programs, sports programs wrapping up. Our little Leo, Leonidas, wrapped up his first year of preschool this week. And so they had a little performance here, kind of citing verses and sharing a little bit about what they've learned and how they've grown throughout the year. And I just love what God is doing in that ministry of Coastline Christian Academy. It's so amazing to see God bearing so much fruit in the lives of our little ones here. Got such a great staff, great team, such a phenomenal community of parents. It's just awesome. And this week, he was excited as he was getting ready for school one day. He said, Dad, guess what? I can put my own shirt on now. I thought, awesome, buddy. That's great. We're progressing. Little wins, right? Well, this week, it seems like, and I don't know if you have little ones, nieces, nephews, kids, you know, grandkids or something like that in your home, but it seems like for us, for maybe a week, and that's a long period of time, a couple days, an hour, there's a toy that's been laying around the house that just captivates their interest. 
Well, for Leo, it's been these little binoculars all week. And, and he gets a kick out of letting us use them. He'll say, Dad, put them on. I say, OK, OK. And then he jumps right in front of me, right? Like he just gets a kick out of that. He's turn it around this way. Dad, you kind of zoom out and you can kind of zoom in. And he's just been kind of bouncing around our house all week, putting his shirt on, thank God, and, and using the binoculars. Zoom out, Dad. It's just been an interesting dynamic. And, and as I was thinking through our text this morning, and as we open a very familiar story to many of us, I think it's helpful to look at this text kind of through maybe two different lenses, to kind of zoom out and to zoom in, zooming out, getting the big picture of what the gospel writer Mark is saying. Why does he include this account in his account of who Jesus is? But then also zooming in, what, what is this text speaking to us today? See, as we zoom out, so to speak, to get the big picture, let's be reminded, reminded that, that the gospel of Mark through the life and teachings of Jesus shows us, evidences to us, a very powerful truth that Jesus is the king that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus uniquely and one and only is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And he's preaching. Chapter 1 is full of this perspective. He's preaching that the kingdom of God is now. It's here. At long last, the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, has finally come. And this is something that, that had been a long time coming for the people of God, to see God's hand upon his people in such a way that they would be victoriously free. The, the Old Testament brims with these promises, and his people were awaiting for this time, this arrival of the Messiah, and he would usher in the rule, the reign of God. And Jesus is preaching that at long last, it's arrived. It's here. And he's calling everyone to repent and believe. That's his primary message. But Jesus is showing through his life, through his teachings, uh, that the kingdom of God di didn't arrive politically or militaristically or in any other way that could be described or interpreted as of this world, but spiritually, in the rule, the reign, the dominion of one's heart. And, and we've seen Jesus teaching parables to the crowds and giving insights to his closest followers about the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God, you know, it's like a a farmer who, who scatters seed into soil. And the condition of one's heart, it matters. He, he would say, like, the kingdom of God is like a lamp that you don't hide, but shines brightly, shining truth and light wherever it's given the opportunity. He says, the kingdom of God, you know, it's like a, it's like a seed, meaning the word of God works in your life somewhat mysteriously, just like a seed that goes in the ground and then a harvest comes forth. The kingdom of God is even like a, like a mustard seed, kind of very small beginnings, but enormous in its impact and influence. And this morning, we pick up the story that Mark is sharing with us in the evening. In the evening. After Jesus has been with people and teaching the people, he's physically and humanly exhausted. And so he gets with his disciples, gets in the boat, and says, hey, let, let's cross over that lake, that Sea of Galilee. But the crowds, like verse 36 tells us, they're still following, right? Like little boats start to gather all around him to make this little trek across this lake, the Sea of Galilee. And it says that a fierce storm, as the New Living Translation says, came up in the evening. 
It's intense. It's almost like Mark personifies the storms. I mean, the, the New Living Translation says high waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. The New King James says the waves beat into the boat. It's as if Mark is describing this storm almost like a, a ferocious animal with its own will. The, the original language here seems to indicate that the, the waves were hurling up onto the boat. Very descriptive. It's an intense scene. Does anyone remember this old, like, I don't know if it's the 90s or the early 2000s, but you remember this old film, Clooney, Wahlberg? I don't know if it's quite like that, but, but get this sense that waves are hurling up onto the boat. It's intense. But why does this happen? I mean, Jesus is there with his, his guys, who, who many of them are not novices when it comes to this lake, to the Sea of Galilee. We know that a handful of them were experienced watermen or fishermen. And if Jesus had at least four guys on his team that knew these waters well, why did they find themselves in this stormy experience? Many of them had learned that when storms tended to happen so often, you would see that they would avoid those times by going out in the evening. That's often why in the scripture you'll see, well, Peter went out at night. So what's up with this? Well, the Sea of Galilee is set in the hills of northern Israel. It's about eight miles wide, maybe 12 miles long from north to south. Some places it may be up to 200 feet deep, and it's below sea level. In fact, it's the lowest freshwater body of water in the world. It's anywhere between like 680 to 700 feet below sea level. And the, the Jordan River there that feeds it goes all the way down to the Dead Sea, also below sea level, which is in fact the lowest body of water on planet Earth. And the valley there, it's just very deep. So picture this. It's like you have this lake. It's below sea level, surrounded by hills. And the hills in this area can reach anywhere from like 1,400 feet above sea level. And in the distance, you have the mountains of the Golan Heights that, that can reach anywhere from like, gosh, 2,500 feet above sea level. Why do I share all this? You, you have a considerable difference in elevation. And so when the cool winds blow from the Mediterranean Sea and they meet the warm air produced by this valley, this lake, it can be a recipe for a perfect storm. In the morning, the lake can look serene, placid, calm. By the evening, well, waves can be hurling up onto your boat. You know, we know that storms, especially around here, can seemingly come out of nowhere. I mean, was anyone around the Oriole Beach area on Monday night? We had our Coastline Skate guys setting up for our Monday night skate um, ministry that we do every Monday here on the campus. And it's, it's just like it is right now. It looks sunny, and then all of a sudden, rain just dumps. Or did you see what happened in Jacksonville last Sunday with these little, little leaguers? There was a, a baseball game on Mother's Day, and these seven-year-olds were playing, and all of a sudden, as this guy steps up to the plate... There's this thing called a dust devil that comes out of nowhere and just engulfs this kid. And this 17 or 18-year-old umpire comes to his rescue. Why do I share this? It's unexpected. I mean, these guys are following Jesus, doing exactly what he's called them to do. Let's get in the boat. We're going to go to the other side. These are seasoned watermen. All of a sudden, a storm comes out of nowhere. They're freaking out, much like that little 7-year-old must have just been freaked out to see that dirt devil, dust devil, pop out of nowhere and grab him. Now remember, this morning, as we're considering this text, I want us to zoom out first to, to kind of get the big picture of why Mark includes this account into his gospel of Jesus, to prove that Jesus is the king. He's the what, church? It rhymes with Messiah. <laughs> Messiah. He is the son of God. This is the point of the gospel of Mark. The point is to prove, listen, Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. Why does he put this 
into the account. Listen, there's something interesting about this time, this culture, even the mentality of the men that would have been in the boat with Jesus. Look again with me at verse 38. It says, we read that the disciples were terrified. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now we get that the storm could have been very intense. We get the reason why they could be full of fear. But even after Jesus calms the storm, did you pick up what it says there in verse 41? The disciples, after Jesus calmed everything, they were absolutely terrified. So that means there's something more going on here than just the winds and the waves that's producing a sense of awe, wonder, fear. Why is this? Well, consider this with me. Today, we don't have very many mysterious frontiers left on the earth. I mean, if Cody from Dude Perfect, a YouTuber, can go into space on a Tuesday, like that's the culture we live in, this was not true in Jesus' day. Not in the time of the men that were on this boat with Jesus in the midst of the storm. See, set yourself into their sandals. And this time, no one knew what was in the depths of the oceans, or, or for that matter, the Sea of Galilee. Humans could only swim as deep as they could hold their breath. A reliable method for determining longitude at sea didn't even exist until the 18th century. Most seafaring c consisted of kind of always keeping the shore in sight. And in Jewish thought, the ocean symbolized chaos, an unpredictable realm where only evil comes from. And a human being, in the face of chaos, they could do nothing. There's only one person that could do anything about the chaos that would come, Yahweh. It was God's power to silence chaos. That belongs to him, absolutely. I mean, this goes back to the book of Genesis. One author put it this way, God's authority over chaos, symbolized by great waters, was such an ancient part of Jewish tradition that Genesis 1-2 was often read as the earth was chaos. Part of what was so great about creation was that God was powerful enough to seize chaos and make something good and orderly out of it. See, for me, this kind of helps put me into the boat with these men, where their mindsets were. It helps me kind of put myself into the emotions and the intensity of the moment that they're experiencing. It's completely ingrained into their minds that there's only one person that can command the waters, and that's God. That's Yahweh. So author goes on to say, perhaps this was the first time it occurred to the disciples that the Messiah was divine. The reason they said, who can this be, is because it's evidence that they had just witnessed led to an impossible conclusion. Only Yahweh could rule the waters with a word, and yet Jesus... Jesus had just done so. Listen, before we kind of consider, Lord, what are you speaking to us in the 21st century through this text? I want you to get the big picture of why Mark includes this in the text. You see, there's a key to Bible study that honestly I wish I would have grasped to an even greater degree, understood and learned earlier in life. The Bible, the, the collection of the 66 books, the different kind of genres of literature that are before us in God's word. Listen, the Bible, none of it was originally written to us, but all of it is for us. You may say, what do you mean by that? Isn't that just kind of splitting hairs? Listen, each book was written. Each type of literature that's in the Bible was written to someone, an audience that it was written to. And each audience lived in a specific time, had their own culture surrounding them. And as you better understand who it was written to, why it was written, the culture that's surrounding them, the better you'll understand and be able to apply what God's word is saying, and the safer you'll be from just getting weird. 
Like, does anyone just want to be weird as they... No. When you read the Bible and understand that, listen, the Bible is for us, and we should read it and study it and apply it to our lives by understanding who, what, and why it was written to in the first place. See, Mark's gospel shows us Jesus. Jesus as the one who came to serve humanity and give his life so that we could live. Mark writes about this in chapter 10 when he says, Whoever wants to be first among you, Jesus says, must be slave of everyone else. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. And, you know, Mark's very unique amongst the four Gospels. Luke was a physician. He wrote primarily to the Greeks, kind of focused on the, the tender-hearted ministry of Jesus. So he kind of hones in on his humanity. That's why when you open up Luke in the first three chapters, you're given the most descriptive account of the details about his birth and his lineage. Matthew, Matthew, who was a, a tax-collecting Jew, his primary audience was the Jews. So what are they concerned about? Hey, is this someone who really comes from the line of David? Is this that promised Messiah? So what does he do? He opens up with the genealogy. John, he opens up with a statement about eternity in the beginning. His purpose was to prove to the whole world, that's his audience, that Jesus is the Son of God. Mark, whom we're reading, was a companion of Peter, really wrote to the Romans. And he begins with an announcement of who Jesus is. Jesus is the King. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. One author put it this way, the gospel of Mark is fast moving and hard hitting. And in rapid fire succession, Mark uses specific events. Pay attention to this. This is important. Mark specifically chose this account of Jesus calming the wind and the waves. Why? He says, Mark chose specific events from the life of Jesus to prove to a Roman audience that he is the Christ, that he's the Son of God who served and suffered and died and rose again. Only Yahweh, only God, has the ability to control the wind and the waves. Everyone in that boat and in the little boat surrounding Jesus on that evening, that was ingrained in their mindset. And Jesus, he wakes up from being in the back of the boat, simply says a word, and the sea is calm. Why does Mark share this with us? Because Jesus is the King. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. You know, there's an author that lived in the 18 and 1900s, well-known atheistic author, known as Bertrand Russell. He, he was once asked what he would say to God if he discovered upon his death that God existed and he was wrong. And you know what his response was? I will say... Not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. This is the whole purpose and point of why Mark includes this story in this account. Jesus, he has authority over nature itself. Jesus is not just this pontificator of parables. He has authority over natural danger. And as you consider what Mark does, he's actually starting a whole new section at the tail end of chapter 4 and all through chapter 5. He, he's shared some parables of Jesus. And now he gives some evidence of the power of Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. You see, in chapter 5, he'll show that Jesus has authority and victory over spiritual demons. Jesus is going to heal a demon-possessed person. He has victory over disease. Chapter 5, you see this woman that has a condition for 12 years. Jesus heals her. At the end of chapter 5, 
Not only does Jesus have authority and victory over natural disaster, demonic presence, disease, but he has victory over death. He, he raises a little girl and brings her back to life. Why do I share all this? One author put it this way. He said, few stories have been more poorly applied than this one. Really? The, the story of Jesus calming the, the storm, the waters. He says, it's not about Jesus just getting you through the storms in life. That's not why Mark includes it. He does that, of course. But this account is about the one who is sovereign and all-powerful Lord. See, I want you to get this as those that study God's word to know that it's actually rooted in history, that the point and the purpose of it is very clear to those who would have been originally reading it. Why? Well, number one, I want you to know God's word well. Number two, I don't think it's cool to get weird if you don't have to get weird, right? So to read from God's word would maybe not be in there. See, Mark's point to this Roman audience is that Jesus is the king, he's the son of God, he's the all-powerful one, he's sovereign. Danger, demons, disease, not even death can stop Jesus. Why? Because he's the king. That's why after witnessing what Jesus does in verse 41, his disciples were terrified. They're like, listen, we're in the boat, we get it. This guy is God. Look at what he just did. Only Yahweh can do that. Only Yahweh can do that. You see, as we take a look at this familiar text this morning, and we're kind of zooming out first, hopefully not zoning out, hopefully you're not already in that place, but get a big picture of what Mark is saying. Here it is. Let me put it as bold and as clear as I possibly can. I want you to get this. Jesus is king. Mark 1, verse 1. This is the Evangelion of Jesus. You know this. We've talked about this many times. Evangelion was a word that was used to describe some big announcement of a ruler. Mark is saying Jesus is king. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. He is sovereign and all-powerful. Let me show you what he can do with wind and waters. He has power over natural disaster. So we're about ready to enter in hurricane season, right? I think it's okay to ask Jesus. Jesus, keep that stuff away, right? <laughs> He's got the ability. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. He's king. Listen, I want you to know that that's the point to those in the first century, and that's the point to those of us in the 21st century. But also, but also, storms. Anyone once in your Christian life ever felt like you're going through a storm? overwhelmed. Jesus, things are hurling up into my life. Where are you? We read this earlier. Let me read it again. Few stories have been more poorly applied than this one. It's not about Jesus getting you through the storms of life. He does that, of course, but this account is about the one who's sovereign and all-powerful Lord. Let me just share this. I don't think it's either or. I think it's both and. Jesus is all-powerful. Can I get a southern amen to that? Amen. He is all-powerful. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. That's who he is. And also, he's right there in the boat with me. He's over the storms in my life. He's not just some distant king that I learn about from the first century. He's not just the promised Messiah to the Jews. He's the God that's in the boat with me. That's who he is. But I need you to first know, kind of get the zoom out of what Mark is sharing that first century would have got. Because listen, there are so many in our culture today. No, nah, the Bible never says Jesus is King, Messiah, Son of God. That's stuff that's crept in. That's family values that are just kind of forming your own. You need to develop faith and look at the text yourself. No, that's not at all what the first century people would have seen. Now, we know what Mark's saying. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. 
very clear, crystal clear, what the gospel says about who Jesus is. But now, in the few moments that we have left together, we've kind of like zoomed out, right? Like, okay, I see the big picture. Mark is showing us through this account, and he's going to back it up with three more in chapter 5, who Jesus is. Let's just take a moment and kind of look at this text and zoom in and see how this text speaks to us today, knowing that truth of who Jesus is. Verse 35. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king. That's more than 18, which I was expecting, so that's awesome. <laughs> Verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although the other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. First consideration, Jesus said, let's cross to the other side. This is something for each of us to seriously take to heart. We can and we should stand on the promises of God by feeling. When you feel it, you should stand. No. <laughs> we should and we must stand on the promises of God by what, church? Faith. 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 What do I mean by that? We best, we primarily, we definitively hear from God through dreams and visions, through cloud formations in the sky, through liver quivers, casting lots, scripture roulette. Right? No. Through the word of God. Through the word of God. Yes, we understand that maybe scripture wasn't originally addressed to us, but it's for us. And in that way, it is to us. Does that make sense? Jesus says in verse 35, let's cross over to the other side. He didn't say, let's go into the middle and drown. What does chapter 5, verse 1 say? Do you see that? It says, so they arrived to the other side. God is faithful. Now, we know that there was a storm between verse 35 and chapter 5. There was a testing that came after the teaching. Listen, that's always how it is. But here's the point. We can and we should stand upon the promises of God wholeheartedly and consistently. Can I just read to you a few promises from God's Word that you can stand on this Sunday, May 21st? God promises to strengthen you. Paul writes this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. God promises to strengthen you. God promises to give rest. Listen to these words of Jesus. Come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. God promises to take care of your needs. Philippians 4, this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He promises to be with you. Joshua 1, 5 and 9. I will not fail you nor abandon you. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He promises that nothing can separate you from him. The book of Romans. I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, nor things present or things to come, powers, height or depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle John says, God promises us freedom from sin. 
It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free, what church? Indeed. And God promises everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Church, we can and we should stand upon the promises of God by faith. We shouldn't put all of our stock in what we think, hope, or wish to be a promise from God. I believe wholeheartedly that God can and does work miraculously, specifically, and personally in our lives. But listen, there has to be. You've got to consider this with me. The human element in that dynamic. You say, what do you mean by that? You know, I can remember years ago, my wife Cece and I were in a small group. And there was a couple, a part of our group, a husband and a wife. Man, they were just walking through a very tough custody battle with their children in a dynamic with an ex-spouse. And they were very passionate, very confident that God had told them that they were going to win this custody battle. And all of us in the group were extremely supportive in the sense that we, we want to see that happen. But we would ask this question, God said? I mean, maybe he did. But let's approach it with just a, a tinge of humility and understanding that we all kind of see through a, a glass dimly. And here was the challenge. Unfortunately, that wasn't the outcome. They, they didn't win the custody battle like they wanted, like they'd hoped, like as they felt that God had told them. And so what happened? Their faith in God was completely shattered. They, they ended up leaving the church, angry and upset with God. Why? Well, because he didn't produce upon what he promised from their perspective. Now listen, I don't know the mind of God. I don't know the whys of God, why he does ever or allows everything that he does. But I can know the word of God and stand upon that confidently, wholeheartedly, and consistently. And I simply just want to encourage you to do the same, to let your faith be rooted in the word of God to definitely hope for the best, believe the best. And if you sense that God is saying, listen, I'm, yes, let's lean into that. But recognize that we all see through a glass dimly on this side of eternity. Jesus told those disciples, let's cross over. Jesus has told you and I many things in God's word that we can put our faith in lock, stock, and barrel. Let's stand upon those and trust in him. See, that's the first consideration I want us to take in together as we kind of zoom in this morning into this text that recognize that we can stand wholeheartedly and confidently upon the promises of Jesus. He will provide all of your needs. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He can and does strengthen you. Often the issue isn't him. But it's where are we? You know, one of the guys that poured into my life so much said, Neil, you always need to be under the spout where God's blessing is pouring out. If you've moved, no wonder. Like, just, just be there with him. Walk with him by faith. But there's a second consideration from this text in Mark 4 that I want us to consider. This storm was in the will of God for their life. It's often been said that there's two certainties in life. Do you know what they are? You know what they are. Yeah. Death and taxes, right? <laughs> Biblically speaking, that's almost true. You say, what do you mean? There's three things. Death, taxes, and trouble, right? <laughs> Those are three things you can depend upon. Hebrews 9, pointed on a man once to die, and then the judgment. Jesus said, as far as taxes, you know, give unto Caesar what's Caesar's. Death and taxes, but also trouble. In this world, you're going to have trouble, Jesus said. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Peter wrote 
Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange is happening to you. Trouble, trials, and storms are normative in the life of believers. Now, now this isn't talking about necessarily the mess that maybe we can find ourselves in because of just dumb choices, bad choices. You, you can reap a whirlwind of consequences just from bad choices, and we all have those to one degree or another. But the disciples, they didn't make a bad decision. There wasn't a thing where they're like, okay, we're just, it's not like Jonah and the storm comes up in this situation. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. And they're in a storm. You know, for the last two summers, and even for this summer, they're planning it again. Our high school students have been traveling to, to Georgia to, to support the work of a church planter there by the name of Ebo Elder. And he wrote something this week and shared it that I wanted to read to you that I think was so appropriate for this dynamic of storms. I'm going to put it up on the screen. He says this. Most of us are trying to make our lives more comfortable, enjoyable, or even appealing to others. We're trying to improve our lives and going to a great length to change our circumstances, all while forgetting who's ultimately sovereign over those circumstances. And in fighting to change the circumstances of life, we can miss the point altogether, knowing, serving, and walking with Jesus. We can and should be content in any situation because we know that God is sovereign over every situation. Sometimes, this is why I wanted to read this to you, sometimes God's best for us is that we're sick or in need or are crushed emotionally or broken or hurt or empty or desperate or unsuccessful or isolated so that we might look to and lean into him, that we might forsake all else in our search for satisfaction, fulfillment, and comfort. And he quotes from Philippians in 1 Timothy where he says, For I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And Paul would write to Timothy, Godliness with contentment, that's great gain. Now listen, that's not to say that if you're in a situation of trouble that you shouldn't necessarily seek to find a way out. That's not at all. But there will be times where God wants to do something in a trial, in a trouble, in a hardship, in a storm that he is leading you to because he wants to lead you through it as the sovereign Lord over your life. See, here's what the enemy would love for you to do if you're in a storm. Guilt. I'm here because of this. It's got to be what's going on. I'm experiencing this dynamic, of course. Look at who I am. The enemy would love for you to be caught up and cast down in shame and depression, thinking that you've done something to deserve where you are. Now listen, we all understand sometimes you make dumb choices and there's consequences of that. I'm not talking about that. Sometimes you're following the Lord and you enter into a storm and you go, what, what is this? And Peter would write, hey, don't think something strange has happened to you. God brings, allows, and permits trials and tests into our lives. That's what James writes. Listen to this. He says in, in the book of James, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. God tests us to prove us, not to cause us to fail. See, our enemy attempts to bring us to a place of failure. But listen, God's desire for you and for me is that we would grow. He doesn't want to set you up for failure. He, he's giving you an opportunity to exercise your faith. See, the best time to use your faith is in trials and in trouble. These are opportunities. 
to walk by faith, to see that you have some, that you have faith. God's saying, let me prove it to you through these trials and these tribulations. Testing brings steadfastness. And God brings storms into your life, not to sink your boat, but to settle your souls. Not to sink you, but to settle you. Not to confound you, but to confirm you. Not to confuse you, but to ground you. Not to weaken you, but to strengthen you. That's what James is writing about here in chapter 1, verse 4. That the end of these trials and troubles is full maturity with God. I mean, I think many of us, what we would say is we just all want to be comfortable. But the Word of God says, go on through the trial with God to grow into maturity. God's goal for your life as you walk with Him is not comfortability and ease, but it's fruitfulness and growth. That's what God is doing in your life. He wants to lead you to develop you, to strengthen you, to confirm you, to settle you, to sure you. And storms are vehicles by which we can experience God. They have the ability to strengthen us, evidence faith, and build endurance. And so James writes, we rejoice in the faithfulness of God because God can take us through any trouble and any trial. When storms hit, you can ask that simple question. What, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you? Verse 38 of chapter 4 in the book of Mark, we find that in this storm, Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I find it interesting that the King James Version says he's asleep on a pillow. I love that description. What does that mean? That when you need God, that's where he is. He's asleep. He doesn't care. There it is. Chapter and verse. No. When Jesus was on earth, obviously as a human, he was one who needed rest. But the picture of God that we see in the storm is that he's at peace. He's there, serenely in control. Colossians chapter 1 says that everything that was created through him and for him, and he existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. Pastor Joe read this this morning as we gathered together in the coffee house this morning for prayer as a team of volunteers. He said, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat as the old King Jimmy would say, resting on a pillow. God's in control. Let me share an extremely theological, rich and deep activity for you to do when you're in the midst of the storm. Here it is. Get a grip. That's the thing to do. Say, what do you mean by that? Get a grip. What? what, what? Pull my, no. Reflect upon the character of God. Remind yourself by gripping upon who God is according to the faithfulness of his word. God is at absolute peace at all times. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. God is loving. Get a grip upon that. God is faithful and righteous Sovereign and just, compassionate and gracious, forgiving and merciful. That's who God is. God is not against you in the storm. He's for you. Well, what's he doing? Listen, his goal might be different than you or mine. I just want to be comfortable. Can I, can I share this with you? That's not God's goal for you. I just want to get to a place where I, I don't have to worry. I just want to get to a place where everything, every duck is in a row. Can I share something with you? And all love, and I don't know that that's God's will for you in every situation. I do know that it's his will for you that you grow, that you mature, that you develop, that you strengthen. 
that you walk with him and get to experience his faithfulness and goodness because storms are quite often the vehicle by which we experience God's presence in our lives. So God in his love and his grace tells his disciples through his son Jesus, let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side. And then a storm. A storm. Get a grip upon the reality that God is loving. Allow the word of God to transform the way that you think. Lean into the community of people of God for strength and support. And take an active approach in AA. Say, what do you mean by that? Attitudes and actions in the midst of a storm. Attitudes and actions. God, I'm going to believe that you're good. I'm going to get a grip upon who you are. And I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you. The disciples do that here. They don't do it perfectly, right? They say, teacher, don't you care? They maybe miss the boat on the reality that, yes, God does care. But listen, if Jesus says about God that he knows and cares about the sparrow that falls to the ground, he cares and knows enough about your situation for him to say, cast all of your cares upon me. Give all of your worries and cares to God, as Peter would write, for he cares for you. Listen to what God would say to the people of Isaiah in that time. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, when the people of God were experiencing a storm, he said, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up by my victorious right hand. See, all of your angry enemies who lie there confused and humiliated, anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. You will look in vain for those who tried to conquer you. Those who attack you will come to nothing. For I will hold you by my right hand, I, the Lord, your God. And I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. Listen, as you listen to that text well into this sermon, you may not be able to visualize what's being said there. God says, I will hold you by my victorious right hand, and I hold you by your right hand. Think about this. If two people are holding one another's right hands, they're facing one another. Face to face. That's how God desires to walk you through a storm. In verse 14 of Isaiah 41, the same chapter it's almost hilarious what he says in this dynamic of, listen, I, by my mighty right hand, want to hold you by the right hand and walk you through. He says, though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid. I will help you. God calls his people a worm. Why? Because he's mean? No. Because it's not about how good and perfect and righteous we are in the midst of a storm. It's about how good God is in the midst of that storm. He's, like, he's saying, listen, you're just a worm, Israel. You're small. It's not about who you are. I, by my mighty right hand, will hold you by your hand and walk you through. Listen, may we get a grip on this. God loves you. He likes you. He, he gave his one and only begotten son for you. He's never going to leave you, never going to forsake you. And if you're in the midst of a storm, recognize that God's goal is to grow, to develop, to settle, to strengthen, to confirm who you are in him. Now, as we kind of close this time out, we've read this before, but I want to read it one more time. Verse 39. It says that when Jesus awoke, he rebuked the wind and waves and said, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm, and he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus got up and spoke to the weather, using the same words that he would use to even silence demons. It's like he said, put the muzzle on and keep it on. And the disciples, perhaps all those surrounding them in the other boats that followed, 
had just witnessed God on display to prove what? To prove that Jesus is the King, Messiah, the Son of God. And his response in verse 40, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus didn't muzzle the wind and the waves because they were the disciples' greatest threats in their lives. But he gets to their hearts. He says, where's your faith? Warren Wearsby shares this insight on this. He says, of course God cares. He arose and rebuked the storm, and immediately there was a great calm. But Jesus did not stop with calming of the elements, for the greatest danger was not the wind or the waves. It was the unbelief in the hearts of the disciples. Our greatest problems are within us, not around us. It was their unbelief that caused their fear, and their fear made them question whether Jesus really cared. Listen, there is no way around faith in your walk with God. And God can give you the faith, but we must walk in it. And a faith that's rooted in the love of God. It's like God would say to his people in the Old Testament in the days of Isaiah. The, the people might say, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. And Isaiah would tell the people, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I will never forget you. I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Peter wrote this. If you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, just keep on doing what's right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. He'll never fail you. Anyone remember this little lovely Pixar character? Just keep swimming. What is Peter saying? Stick with Jesus in the trial. You'll be tempted to, and it's easy to fall back on your own wisdom, the wisdom of the world, or your own desires during a test. Listen, it's a test. It's a trial. It's a storm. But stick with following the Lord. Get a grip on the reality that God loves you. As Isaiah was prophesying to the people, saying, listen, God says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Even if that were possible, I will never forget you. I've inscribed your names upon the palms of my hands. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are constantly and consistently reminded of the proof of God's love for us. You never have to doubt, does God love? Look to the cross. Look what he did. He gave his son Jesus. Are you in the midst of a storm? Get a grip upon who God is. Remind yourself of who he is. Recognize that his goal for us in these storms is our growth. Our growth. And so as we zoom out this morning, we know the big picture. Man, we can see who Jesus is. He's the all-powerful one. And as we zoom in, may we get a grip on who God is by faith and just keep swimming, so to speak. Just keep trusting the Lord and following him, knowing that he's a good God who always follows through on his faithful promises.